Alrighty, can everyone hear me? Fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate you joining the HBAR Foundation side event um, here at IEDA Pavilion. As part of our work, um, actually before we start, who's heard of the HBAR Foundation? Just by show of hands. I see two, three. Okay, so maybe it's time a good to start with an introduction. Um, for those who don't know us, we're a nonprofit. We focus on supporting digital public goods. And I do need to get the clicker to work. All right, perfect. So we're, we're a foundation focused on digital public goods. And what we do is we support organizations as they go through digital transformations, through open source technology, and open source technology that solves market problems, looking at ways we can scale both environmental integrity, looking at things like social justice, understanding how that applies in the case of the carbon markets. We also do a lot of work in emissions accounting. Um, but this is through open source code where we work with organizations that are looking to take this code, bring it into the organizations and use it to scale and enable that transformation. And our mission is to bring the balance sheet of the planet to the public ledger. We work with all sorts of different companies, nonprofits, governments, across industries and geographies to make this happen. And the mission of our Sustainable Impact Fund is to enable this better system of accounting, better system of trade um, in order to drive these different outcomes. And we have five goals that support this mission. The first goal is making climate finance auditable. The second goal is digitizing and open sourcing methodologies, where we've built the largest library of digitized and open source methodologies in the world. Our third goal is to scale validation and verification, enable improvement of process, but also enable tools that allow verifiers to exist in the global south, operating with a digital tool set from day one that enables them to come to market and work with projects in a way that may be more cost effective. Of course, we want to take this digital infrastructure and build data sets that are easier to verify, but also form attributes. And those attributes can inform price in the market in a different way than we, we think about price today, especially in assets like carbon credits. Um, any type of emissions reduction we think about often is considered avoidance, removal, um, or a, a reduction, or even another type of credit or asset. And we want to get it to a next layer deep in order to understand the data and make price, uh, price predictions, which we'll hear a little more about today. And we want these assets to sit on companies' balance sheets where they're also accounting for their emissions at maybe even a product level, in addition to their scope one, two, and three, in the form of ESG reporting on a public ledger. And we want to have full audit trails there to support that. So we've built an ecosystem um, where we, as a fund, enable a lot, of the, a lot of these applications through our goals. We have wraparound uh, capabilities from a consultative perspective supporting these applications um, through folks like Swirls Labs. And Serge is here from Swirls Labs, who helps give technical guidance and advice. We have folks um, from DLT Earth who do academic study of these digital tools. And we have all sorts of other different e ecosystem infrastructure that supports our open source code and the applications who are building on it and the users of those applications, whether they're project developers or communities adopting this technology for their own benefit. So at that lowest layer, we have R&D and capacity building, funding in our investment thesis, as well as technical enablers through that code and different resources supporting. We have the Guardian, which is that open source code base for measurement, reporting, verification with the world's largest libraries of digitized and open source methodologies, different exchanges that have taken that data to integrate with it, different forwards and green bonds, even applications that allow for, say, carbon linked bonds to exist out there in the uh, real world. We have different applications, though, that then support different communities. We have folks like Alcott here to talk, uh, talk a bit about what that looks like. And maybe some of the different outcomes that can now be possible, including financial transparency. And so before we get to those financial outcomes and how we show what financial transparency means, we need assets that are created that are real with full MRV linked to the asset. We have folks who are doing this today, large enterprises like ServiceNow who are enabling customers, including large telcos in the Philippines, to issue renewable energy certificates that way. We have folks who are taking these methodologies and digitizing them in the form of hackathons. We just announced a hackathon to digitize dozens of more methodologies. Um, we put out $100,000 um, in at least 18 prizes for this hackathon to support the digitization of more rule sets from an environmental perspective on emissions, offsets, biodiversity credits to exist. And we've had folks who've been able to do this in two weeks and win, win prizes of hackathons in the past. So it's not a high barrier to entry. Quick turnaround for immediate accountability and immediate use of this technology. And of course, if we're able to map the roles in our methodologies digitally, we're able to have actors who are using our tool sets to fill those roles in the context of the methodology or producing data linked to that unit of outcome. Um, so it could be a VCU in the case of ERA, but it could also be any other type of emission reduction. Um, we can all of a sudden map 
in the same accounts on our platforms that attest data to receive value and uh, value in the form of financial assets. And what that ultimately enables is we can build scores of financial transparency, understanding the percent of, of funds across forwards and spot assets that have been sold on a public ledger to understand the percent of funds that remit back to the community. Not just what goes to the registries, not what just goes to the VVBs, the project proponents, but actually the percent that goes back to the community. And you may even be able to add to the methodology information of how the community is using those funds or in-kind support. We have folks who are buying these assets, folks like Avery Dennison, who have talked about accounting for emissions and enabling their customers to buy these assets. Um, they're already tracking information in supply chains to be able to do this, where they already give folks digital birth certificates for the goods that they produce because they built a supply chain application on Hedera using these services to account for emissions and ultimately enable the purchase of what they're calling carbon reduction units, which could be considered a credit from many of the registries out there available through folks like Tolum. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and with that, we're going to transition to a panel to talk a bit about how we enable financial transparency, how we enable these digital tool sets to create different environmental outcomes, different outcomes for financial equity in communities. And I want to take some time to introduce each of the panelists. Um, we have a fantastic panel with Bankatesh, who helps lead technology at Baron. I'm going to ask him to do a, a longer introduction in a second. Uh, Alexi is CEO of Alcott. Matthew, CEO of Tolum, and Natalie, who has multiple titles, uh, but helps lead SBSTA in addition to uh, her, her various roles in uh, project development. So with that, I'm going to ask each panelist to go through introductions, um, starting with Benkatesh. Thank you, Wes. Benkatesh Sarma. I work at Vera as a Senior Director of Technology Solutions. At that role, I try to facilitate the utilization of technologies and tools to, to make our processes and, uh, you know, availability in terms of what we can offer uh, to stakeholders so projects can move faster and uh, people can make best out of what we have to offer in the BCM space. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Leroy. I'm the CEO and founder of Alcat. We are a project developer. Uh, that means that uh, we use uh, carbon credit to uh, work through market mechanism against um, clim uh, about uh, climate mitigation. Uh, we've been uh, involved in that industry since 2009. That means that we saw the evolution really of uh, the methodology and uh, the potential of technology applied to those methodology. We also recognize that there is a tremendous gap uh, for carbon credit worldwide. Uh, we were told not long ago that we're going to need 280 billion tons of CO2 to meet our NDC. So obviously this cannot come just by technology infrastructure. It's going to need to be bridged by carbon credit. So we need to scale. And we need to scale in a fair way. And that's where we think technology can bring transparency. It can also assure that proceeds are split equitably according to governance which are robust and make sure that the community can be part of that transition. So, hello. This one works. Hello. Oh. Ah. So, I'm Matthew Lawrence and COO of Tolum Earth. So, in the introduction that Wes just gave, you described an ecosystem and uh, what he called the Sustainable Impact Fund. So, actually, Tolum Earth is a recipient of a Sustainable Impact Fund grant grant and we're part of that ecosystem. So within the ecosystem, we're a company that is a digital exchange platform. So we sell carbon credits and other digital environmental assets. We transfer, we take payment, and we retire assets. And the assets that we deal with are particularly the digital native assets that were discussed in the presentation just then. And what we try to do is to ensure that we are selling trusted assets. We're exchanging them equitably with trusted prices and at scale. And to do that, we use a host of technologies, machine learning technologies and other technologies in order to bring that to bear. Hello, I'm Natalie Flores, and I'm here as vice chair of the science and technology body of the convention, of the UN Climate Change Convention. And I will try to add to the conversation um, the needs that um, the convention itself, through the decisions, um, have on, on technology. 
and the various decisions that requires parties to have technology and the cross between parties and uh, private sector. So as part of this discussion, and I realized I didn't introduce myself maybe properly as helping lead the HBAR Foundation Sustainable Impact Fund, but also helping work in managing the roadmap of the technology. And, and you heard a theme here. Every single party up on stage is thinking about technology as an enabler, not just for the Paris Agreement, but for the voluntary carbon markets. So I'd love to ask maybe each of us to think about and share a little bit more about how you're using technology and where you see technology going first and environmental integrity, but second to think about what are the opportunities through emerging technology uh, that you see your organizations taking advantage of and ultimately what you want to see implemented first the environmental level and then what I'd ask is coming back uh, to talk about how that could be potentially leveraged from a social perspective as we move towards financial equity. Sure. <clears throat> At Vera, we are starting our digitalization initiative. What that means is we are going to go digital in our processes. Uh, that means the main thing we do is certify your project and issue a credit. So if that piece can go digital means we have digitalized VCM in a way. Um, in order to achieve that, we are starting with digitalization of our methodologies. When we have digital methodologies in place, some advanced tools and techniques can interact with digital methodologies. So all the manual process of data collection, data validation, data verification, training, learning can be handled by computers. And that computer can send data to digital process and we should be able to issue credits. That's the processing pipeline we are hoping to automate. The reason being, uh, for there are two reasons. One, if these pipelines are not automated, then there is a human steps involved. What that means is we will be slower and also we are prone to errors. I am not uh, worried about we are making errors intentionally. I am talking about accidental errors. And also, VCM, entire VCM space is evolving. We see changes um, every six months. What that change means to stakeholders and other uh, participants in the market is they have to change their process. Analog, changing analog process is a little bit difficult and it's time consuming and we, it can be problematic in some instance where we forget to make that changes. And that means we have a setback. We start with a project, we have to redo it. So this digitalization can help us prevent the accidental errors or errors that are caused by omissions, like we forgot to do something, we, um, we incorrectly typed something in a, um, in a process of carbon estimation. And we all know that most of the data that we see today are collected from remote sensing technologies, sensors, IOTs. If we don't have digital infrastructure in place, those devices are useless in the VCM. So to enable those devices and sensors, we have to do this digitalization. And the digitalization is one piece for maintaining integrity and providing right, val right value. The other aspect is scale. We have so far issued close to a billion units. But what we are looking in the next five, six years is five, seven billion unit. That means we have to grow that many times, which is not possible. So scalability will only be realized if we have entire process end-to-end -end digitalized. Then we can produce more computers, we can add more computer powers, but we cannot add more human expert in the field. So if we don't digitalize, we're not going to scale well. So these two things will have high value. Now, the other question was how it helps environment is that these benefits can be realized sooner. I am hoping in that once we have this end-to-end -end digitalization, the project review process doesn't need to wait for you know months. It would be weeks, possibly. But it also depends on how sophisticated the technologies are in use and uh, 
how integral these systems are. I mean, digitalization also comes with risk as well, like security risk, information risk. But we should be looking at the bright side rather than the darker side. So with the right partnership, with the right collaboration, and with the right tool, we can achieve those. Um, environmentally, we see more benefits. And now, if everything is digital, one day the trading would be digital too. So transactions will be happening digitally. So you can see the prices of whatever amount of benefit was used to generate those credits and how much is that going to that community level too, if we require them. But that is not the requirement in the current space. So that is something as a policy decision. If we all can agree with that kind of mechanism where we disclose the financials, then we will be able to trace back all the sense uh, involved in that issuance. Thank you, Vintesh. So, you know, I won't go into the robustness because you, you addressed that. I will enhance the scalability uh, because at the moment, carbon credits are really uh, a circle of initiated wizard and uh, this needs to go mainstream. So technology should allow us and should allow the community to make their own project without having to invest into a very uh, expensive technical team. Uh, also, I think that, you know, you mentioned the uh, voluntary market and compliance market. Uh, I think it's, you know, the two sides of the same coin, and I think one will converge into the other, and we should talk about pre-regulation at some point, you know, measures like uh, the carbon border adjustment in Europe advocate in that direction. So it's very important that the industry also preempt regulation and I think that transparency for instance is something that should be a common practice even in the so-called voluntary carbon market. Well, there's a problem of trust uh, today in the market and uh, there's a problem of transparency which is the source of that. Technology should allow us to disclose not only where the money is going but also who's deciding how the money is being put uh, in those, in those projects. Uh, as well, we, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, there is a, a urgent necessity for capacity building. And technology could allow us to spread the knowledge. You know, very few people speak Paris. Paris should be taught everywhere, you know, to every type of community, so that they can become active participants into that market. So the two previous answers were very interesting. It's made me slightly forget the question. So I'm going to talk, and if I don't answer the question, let me know. But I think there's two aspects of the technology that, at the moment, are particularly exciting for me. So as we kind of embrace this digital transition, um, one of the tools that Ptolemy is using is called The Guardian. It's an open source tool created by the HBAR Foundation. And what this platform is doing is creating a set of digital data that describes the ecological veracity or the ecological claims of the asset with structured data that makes it comparable across many different types of assets. And it's lots of words that all kind of sound similar to, to other things, but to me it's a fundamental change. It's like an analog to digital converter that's going to create huge data sets of comparable data. And I think those data sets are the kind of things that's going to turbocharge the um, improvements that Bankitesh was talking about. But I think it will even cause some kind of unexpected benefits as well. I'm seeing Raphael in the audience. I saw a panel yesterday where he described some data that was collected and unexpectedly they were able to realize this could reduce the um, impact of malaria and change insurance rates. So these data can have lots of unexpected data. Um, unexpected consequences, and I think it's going to be extremely um, exciting once they're available. The second technology um, that I think will be super um, impactful will be the ability to have payment flows arranged in such a way that the distribution of funds is visible at the time of purchase of an asset and can be verified after the asset has been purchased. So we know that there are issues with carbon credits being bought, there's some kind of slight murky connection between the purchase price and the amount of money that's received with communities. If we take that further to the entities 
that are the SDGs, perhaps they're trying to be supported by the communities, it gets even more murky. So people are somehow losing faith in the fact that this money, which they believe is going to be a sustainable purchase or support to sustainable industry, is not really being used in that way. Now we have an opportunity to have on ledger payments using stable coin, which means that at the time of purchase, the exact distribution of the funds, so how much of that money will go to intermediaries, how much of it will go to the project developers, how much will go to the communities, how much will go to the school, perhaps, that the community is supporting, even down to individuals. That will all be known at the time of purchase and afterwards can be verified so that we can see that the impact that we expect it to have has actually taken place. And I think just one, perhaps, and I agree with the, the impact that the other panelists have said, but why we want a different one is as we move into this new data world, I think there's a new opportunity to try and bridge some of the digital divide. We have organizations like DLT Earth, so we're educating, we're bringing new techniques into the field so people can learn about climate science from a data science perspective, and I think that will help address some of the balance of power that happens in negotiations. The big countries have got access to large data sets, they've got access to large experience. By creating these open source technologies, by making this data public and available, then we're giving people the tools to be able to learn and take up some of the challenge themselves, and hopefully that will balance some of the digital divide that we see. Okay, so from my perspective, we have a um, lot of challenges because um, there's a lot of expectations from the UN Climate Change Convention, specifically because a lot of people like get a little lost on what the process is and what the process means and why are we here, right? So I've been trying to explain in the past two weeks that this is a party driving process and um, the like citizens have been asking to the parties to, you know, have the private sector and all the stakeholders in the table, on the table, um, putting together all these decisions and all these needs. Nevertheless, most of um, these decisions are new to the scheme of what a government needs to put in place, yet private sector is way ahead. And that happens with technology. I had the opportunity of, of chairing um, a whole day session on the enhanced transparency framework and um, the way in which parties are supposed to be reporting their um, emissions and, and the BTRs that are the reports that now countries have to do to report the emissions within uh, the decision that require parties under the NDC to report. And now that you mentioned Rafael, he was also over there as observer. And um, what we had in the decisions that the parties, you know, sit together with their, with their country flags um, to decide how they are going to report that. It's way behind the way in which the private sector is using technologies to monitor the carbon emissions from a specific project or the safeguards that I don't want to say ironically, but ironically also come from a decision from the convention. And then the way in which parties are reporting this is not ahead of, of the time that we are living when it comes to secure transparency. Um, the carbon markets in general has been, uh, it's been a tough year, right? And, and for me, as a former Article 6 negotiator as well, because what we want is see the, the markets evolve and become stronger and have all the system into place and of course be UNFCC backed in the terms that governments can take advantage of all these tools when, it's, when it comes to engage um, with the private sector. But um, there's like a little link over there that we are missing in between the like the whole framework global framework that regulates what comes out of the UN and of course the system that governments need to put into place to have the enabling environment to implement these technologies also because for like because for governments it's really difficult like you know you need to go through through a process of um, bidding 
these technologies or um, public-private partnerships that if they are not regulated by a specific law within the government, then it's an issue. So I think the voluntary market in general has done a lot and the technologies that are in place to monitor both, both the project development, the um, honoring the decision itself because that's why the private sector is an observer to the process, right? And you're putting something together that at the end should be feeding what we are doing here instead of double working. And, and that's probably what, what is happening with Article 6 right now and when, when what we have uh, to decide over here and that now it's in hands of, of the COP, which is all the minister all the ministers together um, to, to make the decisions that are due to be taken. So um, I'm honored to be here, but for me, it's important that private sector understands that in, at some extent they are way ahead, but at the same time like to bear with the governments because of, of the ecosystem in which governments are. And of course the convention itself by requirement of the governments, because as again, it's a party-driven process, should be paying attention to all these technologies instead of us sitting together to decide how an Excel spreadsheet should look like in the UNFCC website. You know what I mean? So I will leave it there because I can keep talking. But um, yeah. Thank you, and I think I think that highlights a need for collaboration, right? A need for collaboration both with the parties private sector, nonprofits as well. And so one of the things that we constantly think about is how we can enable, how we can support folks to get to innovation faster, maybe with less risk, right? And it sounds like, Natalie, from your comments, that the goal is to learn from the private sector to de-risk what could be the future of not just the voluntary carbon market, but compliance as well. This is the last time I'm gonna talk because I have to let the others talk. <laughs> And then I don't, I don't shut up. But, um, I mean, that could be a personal sense of looking at what I'm saying. But um, at the same time, like, we have to respect what the process is, right? But coming from the body that actually governs the decisions that needs to do with science and technology and the decisions that need, that need to deal with reporting and everything, what I'm suggesting is that we can learn from the private sector. Of course, I cannot tell you that parties should, put, should implement what the private sector is doing because that's not even my mandate. But if it's Natalie Flores, not the vice chair of the SAPSTA, yes, if it's the vice chair of the SABSTA, is we have to go through the process, but of course, the private sector experience could feed that need. And that's why I'm telling you, like, we are here within the whole framework of the parade side of the cup while decisions are being taken in another place, but like, parties should be aware of what the private sector is doing. And if we have somebody that is following negotiations that had to deal with technology or that has to deal with ETF, with reporting, with safeguards, or even a tabular table to report or, or remove a credit from the scheme of the whole Article 6, we should be looking into this. And that's why the process has the submissions that actually the private sectors can contribute and also the workshops around the whole thing. But in order to be consistent, you need to be present and you, you like, the tech, like the businesses developing this type of mechanism should be more present. So don't leave it just to cop, but you know, come to the process in, in, in the space that private sector has to, to provide the example. Thank you. And so with that set of learnings that maybe parties could have, maybe I'd like to go down through, through some of the different areas that folks are working on, um, different collaborations that you think are important to share on what you'd like to see uh, shared with the parties to learn from, and maybe some of the examples of innovations that each of your organizations working on. So maybe starting with Benkatesh, could you share a little more about some of the steps that Vera's taken in this area? Sure. Um, 
as uh, Wes mentioned, Vera is non-profit. What we do is really uh, creative commons. Services for the community is our what we do. And overall environmental benefit fighting climate change. So the work that we do are available for anybody to use. Our methodologies are publicly available. That methodology is the first step at MRV process. And we are innovative to take new ideas fast. And we see that uh, it has a value for uh, fighting the climate change crisis. And then we try to work through those process in collaboration with everybody. We have built methodologies in collaboration with 18 different organizations. One MRV, 18 organizations now think about the impact that could have. And when needed, we have also collaborated with one single entity who has some specific problem, but we want to solve that problem too. Um, at Vera the Innovation, we have an entire department dedicated to this innovative work. And I am one of the members of that department. And we are supported by uh, several other experts in the field, in the program implementations, in our policy work, in our legal work. All these are done through collaboration. We run public consultation, even whenever we need to make some changes in our process and programs. So specific to technologies, we are digitalizing our work. We waited this long for someone to come and rescue, perhaps. but. Uh, we started working on our own. And uh, that digital infrastructure is anybody uh, is available for anybody to use. So now uh, you can always create some infrastructure that is much more better than uh, existing ones, because we don't want to disrupt the innovation process. And we allow API to API connectivity to our system so data can flow automatically from the ground. You know, We are working ground up trying to make our technological stack modern so DMRV and platforms can connect to us. And we are open to the idea of collaboration. One example is um, the open source technology that uh, Wes mentioned earlier. We have been working on our digitalization work. We are collaborating with them so we can get all the CDM methodologies that we can potentially use from that collaboration. And creating a digital system is easy. Maintaining and up keeping them up to date is the dip difficult task and it's very challenging. So that's the big responsibility too. When you create a digital system, it should function as per the specification. And sometimes if we don't uh, keep them updated, we don't use them. The updates are needed for technical reasons because methodology or DMRV or MRV needs to be updated. The others, users preference change over time. So instead of typing, we are now used to clicking. That's so easy than typing things. And we have to update the user interface. So this is a tremendous, tremendous amount of you know, effort when we do it ourselves. But with the collaboration, going into the open source technology, taking the best piece of it, customize it in the way we want it, and again, make it available to other communities means this is a cycle of innovation we will, we will do over time to make a perfect solution. And in technology, I don't think there is any entity who could say my solution is perfect. There is always improvement on the ideas that we make. Um, similar example, uh, specifically to address uh, Natalie's concern about, you know, government and NDC, and then there is a piece called registry. Maybe we should think about, do all these countries, over 140, 80 countries, need to build a new registry? Or you can reutilize some of the things that are available in the community. So this is the big discussions, uh, well, big uh, discussion points that we don't discuss, right? So yes, Excel sheet is great, but there are other better tools that are readily available. And in collaboration and you know, open sourcing would take us there sooner. Ultimately, everyone can get what they want. But how soon you can get is dependent on how close you are with others for collaboration, or how open you are to, with others for collaboration. Thank you. So <clears throat> we, um, we incorporated, uh, we created um, a parallel company called Olcatayo, a little bit more than a year ago, precisely to respond to all of that. So from a private sector point of view, 
so, you know, contrary to you, we are for profit, uh, but we're B Corp. So we think it needs to be equitative, and uh, I insisted a lot on that. I think it should be in a global. We are really looking for a solution whereby we could find all the PDDs in the world into one platform, where we could have access to all the monitoring report and see which project performs better than the other and learn from it and make sure that we can have the best practice. Uh, we are also deploying Article 6.2 pilot, ITMO project, for instance, in Senegal. We want to use technology to create a digital baseline on that particular project, which is compost. So there's no baseline on compost in Senegal. So the objective is that we leverage our project digitally from the beginning so that the government of Senegal can benefit from that experience and can also set digital tool that will enable those pro that will enable that project to be multiplied. So again, there's a trust factor that can be created thanks to technology. Even if the private sector is well ahead of the, of the public sector and it's traditionally the case, if we open up Pandora's box and we give access to all that data and the control of that data, I think this will accelerate considerably the deployment of Article 6 or the conversation with some countries who feel that sometimes the private sector is taking abuse because there's a lack of communication and there's a lack of transparency. Then there's the capacity building. So if we can put everything on an open source on best practice and we can exchange also the learning, that means that we would be able to offer an education to every stakeholder, whether they're public servant, whether they're student. Students should also be able to participate into the project and that's why I think you know a digital open source smart AI engineer library for our industry would be necessary and that would also, you know, it's the same spirit as having one registry or maybe a few registry that can communicate so we don't waste time in trying to reinvent the wheel but we leverage what's already exist. So I think when we talk about technology, often we talk about transparency and about data. And perhaps another way to look at that is these kind of technologies and data allows people to actually understand the impact that they're having on a very granular and direct way. And I think one of the things that, that Ptolemyth is doing that's along this line is we're working with a company called Avery Dennison. Um, they have a digital division called APMA. And APMA really is a, a way to track items going through a manufacturing line. Okay, so as things have been made, there's a whole set of things coming to the factories, different items, they get combined into finished goods. And they give each of these items an identity and combine them, and they understand exactly how these things are made. And then what's interesting is they also have methodologies to understand the emissions associated with each of these production steps. And they digitize that, so they understand they have digital assets that represent the emissions at each step of these manufacturing processes. And what that then allows them to do is to connect to Tolem Earth and to buy carbon credits to offset that, which also have digital equivalents. So there's a full trust chain of emissions all the way through to the credits used to offset them. They're retired directly, so this is all kept together in the same set of data. And in fact, it could be made available to consumers in the shop. So you can scan a barcode. You can look at two items and you can decide which one to buy based on your potential climate impact desires. So I think that ability to really put the power in the hands of people in a very granular way is something that, that will be very powerful. It will allow people to make their voice heard. And the current alternative is you perhaps support a large corporation or you kind of try to make some activity that you hope will have these same outcomes, but it's very difficult to understand the exact impact that you could have. So I think one other benefit of technology is to bring that more granular um, understanding to people who really want to make their voices heard. And I know we have a couple, a couple minutes left just to maybe get some final closing thoughts on this intersection of innovation, collaboration, open source opportunities and maybe where you want to see your organization go next specifically, and then where you see 
maybe in the context of the Paris Agreement, the, these contributions going next. Um, and we'll come back. <laughs> okay. See what's going so for, from, from my perspective, what I see, like I said before, what I see as a gap is that um, the process, the government and the private sector, and of course, all the stakeholders from NGO, academia, have a huge opportunity of work together and um, learning from, from, from innovation, from technology. Um, there's a huge need of funding we have to understand that the United Nations, as I like to call, it's a club of governments that pay a fee to be part of the convention from taxpayer money. And taxpayer money is not going to solve the climate crisis. And that comes from innovation to any other type of finance that we need to be deployed to meet our goals, um, either if it's uh, keeping 1.5 alive or meeting our NDCs, or like anything that needs funding to reduce carbon emissions is not going to be solved with taxpayer money. And that's why um, developers of innovative technologies to help the private sector, the banking uh, sector, to sit on the table uh, as the open source and that you guys are describing today over here. Um, can, can take advantage because at the end, that's the people that we need in the conversation. Um, so basically, I think we should have some tool that can allow us to avoid duplicity on what we do and learning from everything that um, you have put together from the private sector and the development of, of project, as Alexis just mentioned, or the technologies and methodologies that Behra has put into place, or um, the experience that Ma Matthew learned. I think that the process itself has a lot to learn. And we just need more spaces in which this could br be brought you know, to the table. Because at the end, we are making political decisions on a legal text that then makes you change your whole legal scheme in your country and create policies. And then something that you decide here needs to be oper operationalized like in three, five years, and that's a waste of time. And so when we are going to be able to get to the technology, we, don't, we won't have the time to, to, to get it. So at the same time, this is a recommendation, being like just as a former government official, I think that we need to have more conversations with government, like the engagements Vera has with Panama or the Alcot has with other countries in the region, from Colombia to Chile to Mexico or any other at all level. Uh, Matthew, I'm knowing about you today, but um, I think we can, you know, change the whole process if we become more aware on what's in the market to make uh, the process more, more effective in terms of, of getting the innovation and the technology. So I think Ben Kitesh said before that, that no technology is perfect, and that's certainly true, that the technology we have isn't perfect. And what I definitely know is that, that we don't know it all. I mean, I'm speaking for the private sector here. Um, but we do know some things. Okay? There are some things that we've learned, other skills that we can bring to the party. And I think this is different. This is my third startup. The first two were pretty cutthroat industries. They were quite competitive. The atmosphere here is different. Okay? We're not looking for high profits. What we're looking for is to find a coalition of the willing. And it doesn't matter where those people come from. It could be private sector, NGOs, government. We're looking to form a coalition of the willing and to get going and make a difference right now, I think. Yeah, I think Matthew has a very strong point on the, uh, on the drive. I think uh, it's you know, un unprecedented collective drive from the public sector, from the private sector, within the private sector. Project developers are talking with bodies like Vera in a very constructive way. We're trying collectively to find solutions 
to really scale up, accelerate, and raise up to the opportunity. And I think what I would like to see in the next month uh, or years is really to have this ecosystem that allows us to share all of those best practices, the best knowledge, to put all the data, because at the end of the day, the hard work is on the ground. So all this part is cognitive, and we should have the opportunity to focus all of our resource on the cognitive aspect of the project, and let the technology and the data do the math, make sure that we're right on the science, make sure that we have access to everything. And that needs to be deployed urgently. Yeah, closing, closing thought-wise, um, we are open to collaboration. And uh, we are open to collaborate with anybody on technology space. Particularly, I would like to say we are collaborating with HBAR on digitalizing our methodologies. So this will bring synergies. We can use CDM methodology, and others can use Vera's methodologies, Plastic, ST Vista, and so on, which will be available in the open source technology world. So we we scale the you know, availability of the methodology itself. And then that will help us achieve DMRV faster and at scale. And we will be uh, working with collaborators on opening up our system via API connectivity that will even make things better for technology providers per, who would be willing to do these and then take the services from Vera. And so, and once we have that in place, we will continue to improve on that initial idea of what is the next step, how efficiently we should be um, uh, working on these systems upgrades and whatever infrastructure we have in place so we can reach the bigger audience and uh, provide multiple benefits and even wider areas, geographical areas. There are some complexities that we need to handle, but yes, that's the way to go. Thank you, and, and I want to say thank you to all the panelists for taking time. I know it's a very busy COP schedule, and there's negotiations ongoing, other meetings. So thank you, everyone here, also, for taking the time today. Um, if you want to get in touch with the panelists, please come up, ask us a question. If you want to get in touch with the Sustain Sustainable Impact Fund, please feel free to send us an email. And we really appreciate the time today. And just want to give a big round of applause to the panelists for participating. Thank you all.